Hi. This presentation is part 5 of a series on stochastic processes with an emphasis on Kalman filtering and robotics applications. It's a very brief overview of the material necessary to tackle part 6 on the behavior of continuous dynamic systems driven by noisy input signals. Most of the material on stochastic processes is summarized from previous parts in the series. The review starts with the basic measures describing the amplitude and dynamics of noise signals. White noise has a very straightforward description that leads to useful simplifications in the treatment of complex processes embodied in the famous covariance matrix. Unfortunately, white noise also presents some potential pitfalls that require mathematical workarounds for the integrations and differentiations required for working with dynamic systems although we'll sidestep most of these for our treatment by dealing with practically generated or simulated noise that's more user-friendly. In video 3 we looked at variance. It's a useful measure of the size of a noise signal. It's the expected or average value of the square of the signal measured in units such as volts squared. However, continuous white noise has an infinite power bandwidth and Gaussian amplitude samples with potentially infinite signal spikes. Unfortunately, these give it infinite variance, and so it's measured by its strength or power per unit frequency instead. In practice, however, generated or simulated white noise doesn't have infinite bandwidth and infinite spikes, and therefore has a finite, if large, variance. In video 4, we looked at correlation and covariance. Correlation is a measure of the similarity between two signals, with a variable time shift between them. It picks out the best match when one signal trace is slid across the other. It's the average value of their multiplications at different values of the time shift. Multiplying these two overlapping sequences together point by point will give a noise signal. If the two zero mean sequences are not related, the noise signal will comprise random positive and negative values and average to near zero. If the two signals, however, are identical, the result will be positive and the same as for squaring each signal value and then taking the average. If the function is applied to just one signal, it becomes a measure of just how rapidly the signal can change. Now, a rapidly changing signal will only correlate with itself over a very short time delay, and correlation of a time signal is closely related to its frequency content as measured by the power spectral density via the Fourier transform. We'll consider autocorrelation functions as defined here. For stationary systems, that is, ones whose statistical measures don't change with time, Correlation doesn't depend on the absolute time scales used, but is simply a function of the time shift, tor, between the two traces. Covariance is correlation corrected for any DC or mean value. We'll concentrate on stationary, and what's more, zero mean stationary signals, when covariance r hat conveniently becomes the same as correlation r. It's also often very convenient to assume that a noise signal is so-called white noise. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. White noise is a zero mean time signal, x, where the amplitude at any instant is a sample from a Gaussian distribution. This centers most values about the mean, but larger going on infinite spikes are possible, with smaller going on infinitesimal probability. The power spectral density, sx, is a flat spectrum of equal signal power or strength, big W, at all frequencies out to infinity. Now, adding up equal power over infinite frequency gives an infinite result. And this, with infinite spikes, gives an infinite value for the variance. So it's convenient to use the strength or PSD amplitude, W, to characterize the signal rather than its variance. The autocorrelation function, Rx, the inverse Fourier transform of the power spectral density is a Dirac function of infinite height and area w, showing that the signal only resembles itself at zero time lag, as its value may change instantaneously and by an infinite amount.
Now, those infinite spikes make practical generation, as well as mathematical integration and differentiation, a bit tricky. In practice, noise is band limited, but it should look like a white noise signal from the perspective of a target system, as its bandwidth is ideally much greater than the system bandwidth, and with large but finite variants. Its power spectral density shows a sharp cutoff at the bandwidth frequency FC. Limiting the bandwidth reduces the signal power from infinite to something a bit more manageable. However, in integrating the signal to find its variance and so on, there's still the problem of infinite spikes. The autocorrelation is spread a bit from a Dirac function to a sync function that narrows as the bandwidth increases. The MATLAB band-limited white noise BLWN source block produces a two-sided spectrum at a specified noise power strength and sample time. The sample time is the noise correlation time because at any time smaller than this it has the same value. It's recommended to be around 100 times faster than the inverse of the target system bandwidth in Hertz to make the signal look white enough. But there's a gotcha here. If the block is directly connected to the averaging power spectral density measurement sync block, which isn't shown here, a conversion is required because that block specifies a one-sided spectrum with units of magnitude squared per unit frequency in radians per second. And hence there's a factor of a half to convert from two-sided to one-sided and two times pi to convert from hertz to rads per second, adding up to a total conversion factor of one over pi from the BLWN source block to the PSD sync. In this example, the power of 0 0.01 and cutoff frequency of 1000 Hz gives a predicted variance of 1000 times 0.01 or 10. A sample time of 0.01 seconds, say, would give a cutoff at 100 Hz and a variance of 1. Often variables are grouped into vectors. For example, in navigation, we may be interested in estimating the pose of a robot P, where P comprises x, y, and theta, the individual variables that fix its position and heading. Taking an autocovariance of a vector involves multiplying it by its time shift itself, and this results in a matrix. The covariance matrix is an important measure of a system's performance. Let's start, however, by considering an autocorrelation of some vector process X, as shown here. The diagonal terms are the autocorrelation functions of the individual variables, and the off-diagonal terms are cross-correlations between the different signals of the vector. For stationary systems, all terms are functions of time, lag, tor, alone. The covariance matrix is similar to the correlation matrix, but with auto and cross covariances instead of correlations. However, as we'll concentrate on zero mean processes, they are identical. Further, if we just for a moment say, choose a fixed value of zero time lag tor, the covariance matrix becomes a matrix of signal variances or strengths. The diagonal terms are the individual signal variances and the off-diagonal terms are cross variances. Here's the rub. If our, in our general covariance matrix our signals are all white noise processes, the cross correlations at any value of time lag are zero. And the autocorrelations are all direct functions of the signal strengths for time lag tor is zero. And hence, continuous white noise processes, which are zero mean, give a covariance matrix of diagonal terms comprising the strengths of each signal in the process under investigation. This is what makes the covariance ma matrix a very useful measure of performance. For example, in the robot estimation filter, say, it could be a matrix of the errors between the actual position variables x, y, and theta and the predicted or estimated values. Before going on to see how dynamic systems respond to white noise signals, it's worth a brief detour into the issue of how to integrate and differentiate signals with infinite leaps. The mathematical work around this problem involves the Wiener process, named after the great Norbert Wiener, who did pioneering work in this field. But in a MATLAB simulation, the integration of a white noise process is not a problem, as the sample signal is necessarily finite and band-limited. The output, formed from the integration, is the Wiener process, 
It's a random walk type or Brownian motion type of process where all previous random jitters up and down accumulate to give a signal that tends to diverge from the mean more and more as time goes on. So this process wanders away further from its zero starting point as time goes on. Now another of the many gotchas in continuous white noise processes is that the expected value or mean of the process is however still zero. And this arises from a consideration of what would happen if we had an ensemble of many parallel Wiener processes when the ensemble average would be zero across the board, while an individual time domain mean will be however far from zero. In fact the best guess of the current mean of any one of the processes is its most recent known value. Another issue here is that the excursions from zero of the signal, and hence its variance, will tend to increase with time, and the statistics of the process are therefore non-stationary. The increasing divergence from zero is known as its diffusion from zero, which depends on the time elapsed. So if W is the strength of the input and white noise, then the diffusion of the Wiener process is W times the time elapsed. While normal Riemann type integration of white noise is not allowed, it is possible to perform a stochastic or Wiener integration. And this involves taking the limit to converge in the mean square sense, allowing some values, like inconvenient infinities up or down, to go astray, providing the bulk of the sample values converge to a finite result. A mean square approach can also be taken to differentiating stochastic signals, but we won't pursue these mathematical issues further here where we can assume band-limited white noise for all practical situations. And we can consider, practically, the Wiener process and white noise to be an integral differential pair. Now this final section, in preparation for part 6, it contains a brief review of how dynamic systems are modelled leading on to consideration of deriving their response to stochastic signals. Continuous dynamic systems are modelled by differential equations. The standard transfer function description of a linear time-invariant dynamic system is shown here. It's formed by taking a Laplace transform of the system differential equation, linking the input and output, assuming zero initial conditions, and rearranging as a ratio of output to input. In general, it's a ratio of numerator and denominator poly polynomials in S that can be factorized into first-order real and imaginary roots, the poles and zeros of the S-plane. But this slide shows what happens from a transfer function point of view if we use stochastic measures of power spectral density instead of time signals for the input and output. The result is the basis of the spectral factorization theorem where the square form arises from taking the transform of the correlation term, the expected value of yt times yt plus tor, where the signal is multiplied by itself. The state space representation is formed by choosing appropriate internal state variables and rearranging the system equations as a set of first order equations in these variables. Linear time invariant or LTI systems can be represented as a set of equations as shown here, where the system matrix A input matrix B, output matrix C and D have constant terms. For a single input single output system like the transfer function case B is a column vector and C a row vector. These linear time invariant matrix differential equations can be solved using the Laplace transform method. Transform and solve as a function of S and then the system behavior can be separated into its natural response to the dissipation of its stored internal energy and its force response to an applied input signal. The state transition matrix phi is a state space equivalent of the system transfer function that gives a natural solution from some known initial condition. The forced response is a convolution of the SDM with the input signal giving the combined solution as shown here. Now we can look at how dynamic systems respond when driven by noise input signals. For the transfer function model, we can simply assume the input to be a noise process. For the state space system, however, there's a bit more flexibility. 
The noise inputs can be added as extra terms in both the system and the output equation. The noise term Fv in the system equation represents the noisy driving signal V with the input vector F allocating that input to the various system states, just as the B vector does for deterministic inputs. The W term added to the output represents the noisy measurement. The solution to the enhanced state equations follows the standard state space model procedure where the natural response is obtained by the state transition matrix operating on the initial state and the force responses are convolutions of the state transition matrix and the input variables integrated over the elapsed time period t minus t0. The noise term here, however, would have to be integrated using the stochastic integral to avoid the infinities. However, this solution is often tricky to implement and an alternative formulation that will be investigated in part 6 is shown here. This is the dreaded matrix Riccati equation, or MRE. It can be solved numerically to predict the changing output covariance matrix P of a system driven by white noise without any awkward integrations or derivations of state transition matrices. And for steady state LTI systems, it reduces to the algebraic Riccati equation, or ARE, in this form, when the solution is a matrix of constant variance terms. So in part six, We'll investigate this and the transfer function approach to dynamic systems driven by noise signal inputs, along with some examples. Please refer to earlier videos in the sequence for more information on the stochastic processes summarized here. Thank you.